Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the online conference on digital economy in the Republic of Tajikistan. My name is Shokat Ali Khan, and it's my honor and privilege to moderate today's online conference. This conference is hosted by the University of Central Asia in collaboration with the World Bank, European Union, and the Strategy East, in cooperation with the Ministry of Industry and New Technologies of the Republic of Tajikistan. In this conference today, experts will talk about the importance of digital economy in the development of the country and also present their research findings related to Republic of Tajikistan. This conference will highlight the opportunities available in digital economy, which is growing fast, especially in developing countries. The core of the digital economy is the digital sector producing foundational digital goods and services. Digital economy has brought many new services which were inconceivable before, such as online home deliveries. And the best example is the rise of digital platforms such as Amazon, Uber, and Airbnb. These companies connect market participants together in a virtual world. Without any further delays, it gives me a great pleasure to invite Farhad Bilolzoda, Deputy Minister of Industry and New Technologies, Republic of Tajikistan, for his opening remarks. Thank you, Mr. Shaukat Ali Khan. It is a great pleasure to organize yet another event together with you, which is aimed at the issues of digitalization and the introduction of new technologies. It is a great honor for me to participate on behalf of the ministry in this event. And as the authorized representatives of the Minister of Industry and New Technologies, I would like to read his statement to you. Dear Professor Sohail McQueen, uh, Dean of the University of Central Asia, Mr. Jan Peter Walters, uh, the country manager of the World Bank Office in the Republic of Tajikistan, Mr. Stefan Nalera, head of the head of cooperation European Union delegation to the Republic of Tajikistan, dear friends. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers of this event. And I would like to welcome and greet all the participants of the today's conference on the topic digital economy in the Republic of Tajikistan. As you know, on the agenda of our today's uh, conference, we managed to uh, get together international and national experts that will tell us about the importance of digital economy for the development of the country and will present the results and the findings of their studies as they relate to the Republic of Tajikistan. Also at this conference, we will cover the opportunities of the digital economy, which is growing fast, especially in developing countries. Dear participants, the core of the digital economy is the digital sector, the sector of information technologies that produces basic digital goods and services. Tajikistan is one of the countries which is at the stage of uh, emergence of digital technologies. And in this direction, the Republic has already made a few steps through the activities of different sectors of the economy. Over the recent years, it has accomplished a number of achievements. And uh, today we can note uh, that uh, different organizations in the country, including state and private organizations are implementing in their activities new digital technologies. Uh, for instance, in the city of Dushanba, we've introduced a system of electronic payment of passenger services under the city car service, with the help of which uh, citizens of the country can pay for transportation services. The implementation of the system has made it possible not only to ensure transparent and uh, reliable transportation services, but it has also been instrumental in ensuring stable provision of transport services to the city dwellers. Thanks to the digital technologies, we can see the successful development of the digitalization of the financial services sector. For instance, commercial banks are actively promoting the digitalization policy in their activities and uh, offer new financial services and products. Thanks to the implementation of new technologies, the banking and the financial products are not only accessible, but also convenient, safe, and less costly. The implementation of new technologies has reduced operating costs of the banks. And in its turn, this um, reduces the cost of other banking services. Dear friends, I would like to note that as far as this question is concerned, the 
leader of the nation, president of the Republic of Tajikistan, Mr. Imam Ali Rahman, pays special attention to this. And this is why the leader of the nation back in 2019 instructed the government of the Republic of Tajikistan to develop and adopt the concept of digital economy of the Republic of Tajikistan. This concept envisages a gradual a transition to the implementation of the digital transformation in the country. In accordance with the concept, the implementation is to take place over three stages up until 2040. It is noteworthy that all the stages of the implementation of the digital transformation within the framework of this concept will also take place within the framework of the digital CASA project. The Ministry of Industry and New Technologies within the framework of its authorities also actively promotes the implementation of the above mentioned concept. In the nearest future, using um, state-of-the-art experience of other countries, we're planning to establish an IT park in the city of Dushanbe with the relevant conditions that will promote the development of the information technology sector. In this regard, I would like to thank the University of Central Asia for their promotion in organizing a roundtable on this topic, which took place recently. Dear participants, uh, today it is impossible to imagine the future development of the economy without gradual implementation of uh, digital technologies. And this is a fact. And I hope that at this event today, the experts and the participants will share their experience uh, that will be taken into account in the further development of the policy in this sphere. I would like to wish everyone good luck with the best wishes, Minister of Industry and New Technologies, Sher Ali Kabira. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Farhad, and thank you very much uh, for the Ministry of uh, Industries and New Technologies for all the support. Um, and the, in, in the high-tech park this initiatives and driving the digital agenda for the Republic of Tajikistan. Now I would like to invite Professor Dr. Sayed Sohail Hussain Nakwi, Rector University of Central Asia for his welcome remarks. Thank you, Shokat. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Farhad and our friends at the uh, uh, Ministry of uh, Industries and New Technologies. It's a pleasure to work with you on this uh, forum and thank you to our partners uh, from Strategy East, World Bank and the EU for providing uh, this platform. It's uh, still mid-afternoon and this is the third meeting that I'm having today on this uh, issue. Started off uh, with a forum uh, with UNDP here in uh, uh, Bishkek. Uh, they have a mission uh, in town and it's all about digitalization and the provision of digital services uh, to uh, the community uh, over uh, here. And then uh, I spoke to our uh, people at the Narin Center for Entrepreneurship. We said trying to set up an entrepreneurship center uh, in the city of uh, Narin, where our uh, campus here in Kyrgyzstan is located. And this will then be followed up uh, with an entrepreneurship center uh, that is also in the process of being established in Poros. Uh, it's a very uh, important uh, issue. Uh, digital technology has opened many new frontiers, not the least of which that we can have these conferences irrespective of uh, language, uh, for example. Uh, the University of Central Asia uh, both uh, works by providing uh, a bachelor's degree in computer science, uh, as well as offering uh, short uh, courses at 15 different uh, locations uh, across four countries of uh, uh, Central Asia. So it's something that we are very, very committed to. It's also something that we have to practice uh, uh, to a very large degree because we cannot be working with 17 different uh, locations and in COVID times without being ourselves um, a leader in the implementation of uh, digital technologies for our work, for educational purposes, for training work, for policy uh, work. Uh, at every uh, level. And uh, uh, we do believe that this is a mechanism uh, to cut across uh, the difference between the haves and have nots uh, in the world. You have access to all of the trainings of the world that is possible to all of the people who are connected via uh, internet. We can uh, fast track uh, development. It's an opportunity for developing uh, countries. And as a university, we are absolutely committed to playing our uh, role uh, in this regard. And a special thank you again uh, to all our partners uh, who are making this event possible. Over to you, Shock. 
thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Dr. Said Suhail Hussain Nakwi. And now I would like to invite Jan Peter Walters, Country Manager, World Bank Office in Republic of Tajikistan, for his opening remarks. Thank you so much uh, for the, the invitation um, and uh, uh, the ability to contribute to today's um, online conference on the digital economy that in the end could not have been organized at a more opportune moment in time. The impressive interest that we are witnessing here today is just a mere reflection of the anticipation and hope that digital transformation can do exactly that, namely to propel the country from its position of geographic periphery to the virtual center of emerging private sector-led activities. Today's discussion benefits from the increasing sincerity to find a way to respond effectively to the four overarching development challenges spanning legacy issues, demographics, climate change, and the COVID-19 pandemic. We are seeing encouraging signals of political willingness to translate the combination of increasing constraints and opportunities into sources of development and future prosperity. These efforts stand on two pillars of green recovery, largely related to the generation transmission of clean electricity and the creation of a partnership with the private sector. Regarding the latter, essentially being an increased focus on the business climate, starting with the ongoing efforts on tax reforms, and on preconditions to create high quality employment opportunities in the rural remote regions of the country where about 70% of the population live and work. The two key sectors with the highest potential are one, agriculture with storage, food processing, food safety exports, possibly a link to tourism and digital transformation. And here with a view to increasing the quality of public service delivery and crowding in private sector activities. To be able to leapfrog into a digital future, the focus would have to be on the institutional infrastructure environment that would help to improve tangibly the reliance and speed of and re reduce considerably clients' costs for access to the internet. Global experiences in the current COVID-19 context have shown that affordable high-speed internet plays a critical role in preventing service interruptions that otherwise could contribute to welfare, revenue, and employment losses. Governments and businesses across the globe have negotiated virtually, have had online seminars as we do today, while, benefit, uh, while families have been benefiting from access to online education and e-health services. Tajikistan has already seen the benefits of an advanced ICT industry. During 2000 to 2015, it was one of the country's fastest growing sectors, contributing to socioeconomic development and indirectly to state budget revenues. Through transparent licensing procedures and low licensing fees, Tajikistan translated effectively its economy's relative weakness, low penetration rates, into an ability to attract reputable international operators. In early 2015, the telecom regulator reported ICT revenue growth rates of close to 15%. Since then, however, growth revenues in the ICT sector have started to fall gradually, with the number of new sus subscribers having begun to decelerate. This has affected the present situation. Today, Tajikistan is still constrained by limited access to and high prices for internet services, especially in rural areas. In 2019, far less than one in a hundred households had broadband internet access and that primarily in urban areas, and only 35% had mobile internet access. Similarly, only a handful of enterprises have broadband access and fewer than 1% offer digital services. This limited use of the internet has hindered economic development, including the transformation of the country's industrial sectors. The situation is aggravated by high prices for international connectivity, the high cost of public services, limited local connections, and weak content development. This explains the necessary focus on regulatory environment and the required level playing field in the market, currently still dominated by a state-owned telecom company with a policy recommendation to separate the telecom regulator from the operator. By removing entry barriers and implementing a modern regulatory framework, 
Tajikistan could attract more private investment, thereby creating a virtuous cycle of newly established profitable private enterprises that would co-finance the deployment of broadband infrastructure and improve network capacity, including last mile investments. That is to a large extent the hope and vision of the potential that is inherent in the prospect of digital transformation and the significance of today's virtual seminar. With that, I wish all of us a most successful and impactful virtual seminar as demonstration effect of the potential inherent in a truly digital economy. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jan Peter Alters, for the excellent support and collaboration from the World Bank to organize this, uh, this conference. Now I would like to invite uh, Stefano Elero, Head of Cooperation, European Union Delegation to the Republic of Tajikistan for his opening remarks. Thank you, Chairman and uh, distinguished guests. It's, uh, it's a great honor to be here today because uh, the European Union considered the digital sphere, the digital, we call it even digital era, a, a critical element of development for the Union itself and for, for the world. So uh, this uh, digitalization and, and the proper progress in the digital sphere is, is one of the key priorities of the new commission that has been uh, enshrined uh, two years ago and that is pushing through in, uh, also in this, in this current moment. Uh, and especially in view of the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. So for this reason, from the very beginning, we've been working closely with the World Bank in trying to push uh, a discussion, and this is an example, and then uh, the progress on the digital agenda in Tajikistan, as we strongly believe it is a critical policy area for ensuring a bright future for the country. And we also believe that there is a big potential in Tajikistan already shown by some bright example of uh, cross uh, of, of uh, let's say ice breaking initiatives in the country notwithstanding a general a, a general background in the sector which is not up to the necessary uh, necessary standard to promote all this potential as i said the covid-19 pandemic as a uh, a major and negative impact on global economies, including Tajikistan and other Central Asian countries. And that shed, uh, shed a light on the fact that the more innovative and digitalized, digitized country have been better able to respond to the ensuing socioeconomic challenges. Therefore, we encourage Tajikistan to take up the necessary reforms to move forward becoming a modern, sustainable digital economy, especially being uh, with the specific characteristic of the country, which is a landlocked country. So uh, digital connectivity may be a key element more to promote the development of the country. As said, and as already mentioned also by Peter, uh, digital transformation is becoming an essential catalyst for the development of all sectors. And it requires proactive and cooperative engagement, but all stakeholders, all actors in the public sector. These among many other activities uh, include ensuring better and more accessible public services, improve education and healthcare, private sector development. It's not a, just about infrastructure investment. It is very much more about reform that should be prioritized in order to push the digital agenda. However, there are also many practical opportunities for digital transformation, which include developing technology parks and a vibrant startup ecosystem. Some of it is already existing in Tajikistan. We are following with a lot of attention and we are ready to support this in our next strategy that is starting now. The European uh, Commission is, the European Union is budgeting on a seven year cycle and the new cycle starts with 2021 and will last until 2027. We haven't put uh, 
digitalization as a specific sector of partnership, but we have stated in our in our strategy that is under approval that digitalization will be a cross-cutting issue underpinning all the priority sectors that we have identified in the strategy. And we are totally convinced to push whenever possible the digitalization aspect of any sector in our strategy. To better understand, in fact, the current situation with digitalization in Tajikistan and what needs to be done for further in digital transformation, we have already hired a local consultancy, Civil Internet Policy Initiative, to perform a preliminary analysis on the subject. And the result of this work will be presented today. I'm very proud of it. And uh, everybody is, is invited to provide input and comments on this work that is just a seminal work. This initial work, is, is, which is a, is a limited scope, is, is already followed by an in-depth digital capability strategic analysis, which will support the development of enabling environment for a modern digital economy. For this purpose, we have hired the International Consultancy Leuven Consulting, and some of the members of the team that are conducting this in-depth analysis are attending this meeting. This follow-up digital analysis will take a closer look into five essential areas of reform and investment to enable and further digital transformation. These areas are the telecommunication sector, of course, e-governance, digital education and skills, digital entrepreneurship and innovation, and digital resilience and crisis response. We're really looking forward to have a full cooperation on this analysis that can underpin the next phases of all our investment and partnership with the Republic of Tajikistan. As my last remark, I would say that crises such as COVID-19 and climate change have shown that reforms tailored towards long-term recovery and resilience are more important than ever. Digital transformation will play a crucial role in ensuring Tajikistan's socioeconomic development and achievement of the SDGs. We stand ready to support Tajikistan in this endeavor. Thank you for your attention and the space given to me. Uh, thank you, Stefano. Thank you for your uh, welcome remarks. Uh, thank you, dignitaries, for your welcome and opening remarks and all the support from your institutions to organize this conference today. Uh, I can see that there are a lot of um, uh, people uh, waiting to get into the Zoom. Uh, just for your information that uh, in addition to Zoom, we are also live on the UCA uh, page, EU page, and also World Bank and then Strategy East page. So you, are, you can easily uh, watch this conference live on that, those platforms. And you are also able to uh, ask your questions in the comments because we are picking the questions and then we will forward them to the uh, speakers. And all the um, participants who are watching us from Zoom, uh, you can write your questions in the Q&A section, and then at the end, we can, uh, we can post them to the relevant speakers. Uh, it gives me a great prayer to invite our first speaker today, Mohammadi Ibadullah, uh, Director of Public Fund Civil Internet Policy Institute. Uh, Mohammadi will talk about the state of digitalization in Tajikistan. Good afternoon. Thank you, Shaukat. Dear participants, dear ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome each one of you at this platform and I would like to thank the organizers of this event. It is an honor for me and it is a privilege to say a few words at this event and discuss the relatively new stream for development of our country, digital economy. My presentation is based on the strategic analysis of the digital economy in Tajikistan that has already been referred to previously. The analysis was prepared with the financial support of the delegation of the European Union in Tajikistan. On the basis of the methodology and in partnership with the World Bank. If I may, I would like to show the presentation now. Yeah. 
Demonstration ist Rama. Wort. The concept of a digital economy, let me switch off the video for the quality to improve. So the notion of the digital, can you please switch on your video because on Facebook people are actually um, watching the video. So it would be better if you could please switch on your video. Is developing constantly due to um, digital technologies, whereas previously the concept of digital economy was uh, restricted to e-commerce and ICT. Right now, it takes into account new opportunities of uh, digital technologies and offer an impact on all the aspects of our livelihoods. So this study takes advantage of the broad understanding of uh, digital economy, including not only the digital sector and e-commerce as such, but also digitalization of uh, governance, uh, business and industry, and also the society at large. The ecosystem of the digital economy, according to the suggestions of the World Bank uh, is, uh, a house of sorts that consists of uh, non-digital or analog uh, foundations, uh, then uh, digital uh, foundations and the digital sector uh, where the digitalization is based. And the government, the business and the population that in its turn will provide, uh, provide digital the dividends. Speaking of potential benefits, um, for instance, for the citizens from the digital economy. The citizens uh, can uh, save hundreds of millions of dollars thanks to cheaper telecommunication services, a lower cost of government transactions due to business trip expenses and the waiting time, as well as uh, lower um, government fees and levies. Uh, retail, e-commerce reduction of transportation costs and uh, cheaper retail prices. The enterprises outside of the ICT sector that are part of the digital economy can promote economic growth and employment thanks to the supplies of digital goods and services. It does not include all the facets and um, we would like to discuss this in greater detail a bit later. This data has been uh, kindly provided by the World Bank team. It was um, prepared by Michael Ninders, uh, the consultant on the trends and the impact of digital technologies. Well, as far as the methodology is concerned, of our study, it uh, consisted of the following snapshots. So we had some snapshots of the development of the digital economy on the basis of the existing global indices and official statistics. Then we would analyze the current state of digitalization of the government and the business and the population as such. We would also conduct the analysis of the readiness and preparedness for the digital economy of non-sector, non-digital and the digital sectors. We would also analyze strengths and weaknesses as well as problems and opportunities for the development of the digital economy. And based on that, we were developing the recommendation for the strategic planning of our digital economy that I would like to share with you today. My report, will have several sections as i said before there will be several chapters uh, parts of our analysis the digital dividends digitalization digital infrastructure and platform cyber security enabling environment and potential economic benefits after each uh, part uh, we will allocate a couple minutes for q a sessions and besides the questions could be asked via uh, uh, emails we will provide you more detailed answers so now if you allow me i will start in my presentation based on each chapter we will present information on uh, uh, 
the global indexes of Tajikistan, the results of our SWOT analysis, SWOT analysis itself and the recommendation. We will provide recommendation based on each part of my presentation, part of our uh, analysis. So according to the WEF Global Economic Competitiveness Report for 2019, Tajikistan is uh, on 104th place with the score 52.4 out of 100 possible scores. Uh, so the main factor that uh, uh, hindering development of economic competitiveness, very weak innovation activity, low ICT penetration, small market size, undeveloped institutions, and uh, all indicators for these groups of indicators in Tajikistan are lower than Eurasian average. Our gap analysis this showed that in general understanding of economic and social benefits from the social transformation for the economy uh, uh, is, the, exists. Uh, many uh, emphasize the great access to global and regional markets, cross-border trade, new business opportunities, productivity growth. Now, it was also emphasized uh, that there were better access of, uh, among citizens for the public uh, services, new opportunities for uh, employment uh, and communication and networking. In terms of SWOT analysis, if you will see the strengths or market of the digital dividends, first of all, is the policy and the legislation norms that were adopted starting from 2000, focused on using benefits of ICT nationwide, in particular strategic goals for the development. The legislations create necessary environment for uh, using ICT and uh, ICT-oriented facilities from the market needs, uh, exit from the communication. Basically, will be to best practices, multi-purpose use of infrastructure, transport communications and telecommunication energy independence that created by the local uh, electric sector uh, has uh, many benefits and uh, at the same time uh, monopolization of the city market the dependence of city industry regulation on the market licenses the executive branch of the Govern, migration of transition diminution on their institutional interest for the national ones of the digital economy. Um, sustainable political will of using uh, digital dividends supported by the initiation of participation in the regional projects, CASA, uh, digital CASA as well. So the, uh, the infrastructure of the Casa 1000 could be also used for the needs of telecommunication companies by the region. And uh, by joining the transnational project Casa 1000, Tajikistan uh, uh, moved forward and improved the adv advanced uh, competitiveness and building capacity in the region. I think it will we will also be more uh, actively e use ICT for internal and external needs by cooperating with other countries of the region. At the same time, the uh, provision of the uh, availability of digital dividends allow us to use them and strengthen the uh, competitive advantage by reducing risks and creating new opportunities. For example, the digital ICT reduced the distance between the consumer and the manufacturer or provider in reducing the cost of the services and also digital services providing industries and promoting industries. Uh, ICT use integration, uh, providing opportunity for three L so called everywhere from every place, uh, every time, and form the basis for the multi purpose use of the infrastructure in many sectors of economy. But at the same time, for comprehensive use of the digital dividends for the most important factor of success is existence of the dynamic. Um, compliance uh, with the needs of the market, 
something like uh, independent uh, regulation of the industry, accountable institutions um, uh, that focusing on monitoring and the real data, human capacity providing support for the development of safety and security of the growing market lack or formal existence of such additions build the digital dividends into the digital risks creating vulnerabilities which could be used for the wrong purposes and uh, basically increase the digital risks and the weaknesses that the private provides here covering some of them for example, the dependence of other industries on the losing ICT markets, the detachment of ICT facilities from market needs, high tax rates for ICT services, weak uh, ICT integration of interdisciplinary specialties, poor coordination of analog add-ons, regulation skills and <clears throat> accountable structures. There are certain threats that we observed during recent time in our local market of ICT, which substantially decreased the accessibility of the digital dividends. And of course, uh, uh, something like monopolization of the ICT market, the dependence of the ICT industry regulator on the market licenses and the executive branch of the government. Migration of traditional domination of narrow institutional interest over the national ones to the digital economy, importing legislation uh, to the regulate the online relationship of the countries, uh, producing digital goods and services. So based on that, uh, based on that, our team developed several recommendations. And uh, this is, we need to conduct audit of the uh, regulation and normative uh, regulatory acts, establishment of independent communication regulator, reducing taxes on the ICT industry, reform of the ICT training system, and uh, active participation of Tajikistan in regional and international projects, as well as active business involvement for the development of the digitalized economy by public-private partnership. So this is the uh, recommendation for the digital dividends uh, chapter uh, that was part of our analysis. So if you have any questions, please, uh, we could answer a couple of the quick couple of questions and then we can proceed with the next part of our presentation. Please. I can I can see that there are a couple of uh, questions, but uh, those are relevant uh, to overall uh, uh, overall matters regarding the internet connectivity. Uh, so, but uh, uh, Mohammadi, maybe we will take the questions at the end. We will. I am monitoring regularly on the QA section, and then as soon as there are questions, then I will I will forward it to you. Okay. Okay. Great. Great. Great, thank you very much. I will be happy to help. Uh, thank you. If you will thank help you. me with the questions. Thank so you, uh, next, uh, I would like to uh, proceed with the next chapter of my presentation. This is the digitalization, and we will provide this information on the level of the digital exceptions and the digitalization status uh, 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 of business, population, and government. So I will start also from the global indexes. According to the World Bank Digital Acceptance, according to the World Bank Digital Adoption Index 2016, Tajikistan ranks on the second lowest performer in Central Asia. So the, uh, we are on the 141st place out of 183 countries and score is 0 0.32, a possible scoring from 0 to 1. So I would like to emphasize that the analysis was using only official sources of information. That's why we provided the data from 2016. Maybe during the recent years, the indicators uh, were changed, but uh, we decided to work only based on official statistics and official data. Uh, in terms of the progress, 
of the e-government. According to the UN e-government development index for 2020, Tajikistan is ahead only of our neighboring country, Turkmenistan, and behind other countries of Central Asia, as well as the world leader, Denmark. Tajikistan is considered an average OSI country uh, for the provision of online government services. And Tajikistan still uh, lags behind Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and Uzbekistan in providing government online services, as you might see here on the graph. In terms of the progress on e-commerce, according to the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, UNISTAT uh, B2C e-commerce index for 2019, Tajikistan uh, takes position on 129 place out of 152 countries on the e-commerce development B2C with the scoring of 25.7 with the 100 maximum possible. Uh, in terms of uh, progress of e-participation of the citi of citizens, uh, Tajikistan, according to the same UN e-government development index for 2020, Tajikistan ranks 146 out of 193 countries with the scoring in average 0 0.35 out of uh, total scoring from 0 to 1. And uh, as of today, the number of online services increasing by the um, different online services to the citizens like internet banking, like uh, mobile wallets and visa application as well. And uh, we have several uh, efforts to create uh, by the government to create database for further development of e-government. So our state services for the business companies and for the business for entrepreneurs in a line form format is very limited. Uh, for example, the registration of the business, permissive papers, and etc. At the same time, there is no um, single uh, mechanisms for monitoring. There is certain requirements for the feedback uh, for the websites of the public authorities which are technically implemented but how they process data and how what are the response pro procedures they are not trans it's not transparent and it's hard to monitor for the identification authentication uh, users according to the law on digital signature used to ensure security in the provision of electronic services even though in business sector they do using login and the password for identification authentication of users in terms of the national register and databases like register of the population enterprises uh, properties transportation vehicles uh, land properties and etc uh, they existing in the paper as well as in the digital format depends on the uh, uh, request uh, by authority the information could be provided either in the digital form or in the hard copy and citizens can get the information partially on the website or based on the request in the limited form uh, just this, this information, just the personal information. And uh, if uh, we will do this, what analysis of digitalization, uh, the uh, digitalization of the government reminds us computerization of schools, which we experienced several years, uh, which straightening the domination of different IT departments over the growing technical capacity of the institutions. But at the same time, there is a, some strengths like uh, transformation to the digital economy. It's uh, the development of we government, uh, um, uh, which uh, stimulates by uh, accessibility of public services, increasing the capacity of digital citizenship development and tangible goods and service industries and uh, uh, without uh, additional budget. So the process of trans digital transformation stimulate growth and coverage of the digital services. 
and they also aiming on the three above mentioned stimulations. And it's not achievable unless we will introduce a radical reform of all business processes. So accessibility of the commercial uh, services indicates growing of human capacity of local specialists. Accordingly, this capacity will give us positive effect on digitalization of uh, interaction between citizens and government through outsourcing of the project for e-government uh, to the business sector or through attracting highly qualified specialists for direct implementation of such initiatives and projects. So accessibility of the public services also depending on technological skills of the citizens uh, because they are building capacity nowadays by using commercial services, which is also indicates about the access to it. Of course, there is a need to create additional physical infrastructure to for access to the services, which substantially reduce potential financial costs and growth of potential growth cost, but growth of this capacity uh, using available public services, citizens by using them, of course, building their digital capacities, they participating actively in the monitoring of quality of provided services uh, through the education and by building maybe in the future new uh, services. So uh, citizens with the digital literacy, they are reliable partners in the development of the e-governance and development of the uh, services developing tangible goods and service industry available everywhere and it's provide growth of the consumer from the regular consumer to the consumer of highly techno high te technology digital products at the same time this process creating the critical mass of users uh, producers of intangible goods which uh, has a valuable impact into development of the digital services uh, some of the services uh, opportunities directly connected to digitalization of the governance. You might see here in the list, the stimulation of the growth of e-commerce, uh, reform of the state uh, governance. Uh, uh, public administration without the quality of study and reform of the traditional system of the governance. For example, e-governance, they will digitalize all the documents, digitalize all the relationship and interaction between government and citizens. So digital by design, so-called. And also uh, intangible goods uh, available for the citizens. Considering all the above mentioned practices, uh, we prepared several recommendations for this um, uh, part, and we, pro we recommend revise the Tajikistan ADC electronic documents laws to encourage the development of the electronic documents management and the use of var various ADC technologies. Um, maybe uh, all of you know that today our new law on digital signature uh, stipulates only one type of signatures. It's digital electronic signature. And the re-engineering of the business processes in the digitalization of public services, because uh, uh, strengthening the capacity and authority of the e-government focal point, we are here talking about the uh, building the authority as well, which will allow coordinator to implement all the project, project. Development of the electronic open data resources and the accessibility. Um, this is the key recommendations that were provided. If you have any additional recommendation, we will be very happy to review them and include them. And uh, uh, so we decided what to postpone questions till the end, 
or we will proceed with the question and answers now. If you don't have any questions, we can proceed to the next chapter. If not, we can allocate a couple minutes for Q&A session. Uh, there are a lot of uh, questions, uh, oh. um, uh, for example, but, uh, but I would suggest uh, you com complete your presentation and then we can, uh, I can uh, put the questions forward. <laughs> <laughs> so we're not stopping basically for the Q&A session after each chapter, am I correct? We're just going to put yes, them at the that, end. Th that's correct, that's correct. Okay, great, thank you very much. So then, in terms of the uh, digital infrastructure and the platform, I can say a lot, really. Uh, for example, the digital dividends, the impact of ICT on society, and the development of the nation. Uh, uh, we provided, uh, uh, we reviewed the uh, global indexes, and according to the uh, Portals and Institute Network Readiness Index. Uh, Tajikistan ranks on 109th out of 134 countries uh, studied in terms of the impact, studied in terms of the impact of ICT on nations' development and competitiveness with the scoring of 34.14 at the scale from zero to 100. And uh, since we don't have a data for Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan, Tajikistan lags behind other Central Asian countries. In terms of the, the impact of the digital technology on the business models, according to the global report by Cornell University, in said and the World Intellectual Property Organization on digital innovation for 2020, Tajikistan Tajikistan ranks uh, on 109th place out of 131 countries studied in terms of the impact of the digital technologies on organizational models with the scoring of 22.23. And Tajikistan uh, ranks 133rd in the infrastructure subcomponent and on 128th in the business complexity subcomponent. Uh, in terms of the legislation-based uh, regulatory framework, global perspective on ICT regulation, according to the ITU Global ICT Regulatory Outlook uh, for 2020 report, uh, the uh, Tajikistan ranks 187th out of 193 countries in the world. I also want to emphasize that this indicator is closely related to the provision of the official data uh, by the country and the uh, low uh, uh, ICT regulator scores in Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan lower the average scores in CIS region in general. Uh, so in terms of the digital infrastructure and international internet uh, bandwidth according to the same uh, ITU report uh, for 2018 in Tajikistan the internet bandwidth is 2.2 kilobytes per internet user according to telegeography Tajikistan's internet bandwidth used in 2020 has almost doubled compared to last year standing at uh, 123 gigabits per second. But Tajikistan has low international throughout put in Central Asia. Uh, in the, Among all the countries in Central Asia, as you might see here on the presented graphs. In terms of the prices for the fixed bread broadband access, according to the same ITU measure, Information Society 2018 report, the cost of fixed broadband access in Tajikistan is well above the standard adopted by the Broadband Commission, which is 2% of the average uh, per uh, uh, GNI per capita per month. Uh, and Tajikistan has the second highest price 
uh, as uh, the percentage of GNI per capita in Central Asia. For example, if the customer signed the contract uh, with uh, this uh, service, Tajikistan has the second highest uh, indicator. As uh, GNI per capita in Central Asia, as I said, uh, so, uh, if we will evaluate country according to those criteria in Central Asia, only Kazakhstan meets the accepted affordability criteria. So, the average download speed and average cost of broadband access, according to the global cable report for 2020, Tajikistan ranks 25th place uh, 200 sorry 215th place out of 221 countries with the average download speed of 1.01 megabits per second and 33rd out of 211 countries in average broadband access costing us 19.76 per month in central asia tajikistan is ahead of turkmenistan but behind other countries as you might see here on the graph uh, regarding the prices for mobile broadband access, uh, this is the, also the data of the report. The price of mobile broadband access phone-based uh, with the minimum data capacity of 500 megabyte per month in Tajikistan is the highest in the Central Asia at 2.96% uh, of the average GNI per capita per month. And price of mobile broadband access computer-based uh, with the minimum data capacity of one gigabyte per month in Tajikistan is more expensive than accepted threshold of 2% and is 4.96% out of the average GNI per capita per month. Uh, on these indicators be, regarding the cloud technologies in the public sector, we have the infrastructure uh, for the virtual services, servers for GUPA, so called. Basically, it's for the uh, uh, public uh, uh, institutions. In terms of the digital platforms, what digital platforms are being used by uh, businesses and the entrepreneurs, we need to emphasize that we uh, plan to start the portal for the public services. And for now, citizens already using uh, portal for public services, for the taxation office and for the custom services as well. So our analysis showed that uh, technologies are not used and at the same time in the business sector they do using I ios internet of things and 3d technologies so some of the indicators uh, this uh, indicator showing uh, with the high pro related to the high price of the internet services and the other factor is that affecting is instability of the networks uh, particular in the villages uh, so digital infrastructure and platform of SWOT analysis are very critical objects uh, that require strategic multilateral approach for the provision of their safety and they are providing uh, accessibility of such advantages like a coverage of the public services on 3L principle, which I mentioned before already uh, with this, any services. And uh, despite the uh, different uh, uh, data, any citizen can have an access to from any device a very important factor on success in this context is the strict following of many platforms like platform of independence and interoperability of the inter uh, systems that used for provision of the services. The stimulation of growth, uh, including uh, uh, digital technologies in the uh, 
uh, state governance could serve uh, as a very good mechanisms for the outsourcing, for the involvement of all counterparts. By this, they're stretching in the uh, similar rules on the market. And uh, it's also affect uh, the, the general benefits. So this is our, this organic approach can stimulate the competitiveness growth for SMEs and can facilitate multi-use of communicational structures, which also will have a tremendous impact on achievement of strategic goals, digital transformation of the country into the communication transit, transit uh, of the regions. At the same time, we do have uh, certain constraints or weaknesses on this matter. For example, um, that could constrain uh, above mentioned advantages and goals. Uh, such weaknesses are uh, created by gap between the state uh, policy on sustainable development and measures, practical measures that are implemented that uh, focusing on uh, protection of interest of certain dominating agencies. Basically, those measures are straightening the position of certain uh, public unitary uh, institutions by creating the conflict of interest in the different sectors of the market, the regulator of which is the same authority, which coordinating the activity. And the complicated uh, system for the permission papers and for the ICT licenses, poor scaling up of the infrastructure, which are a weak uh, scalability of infrastructure and focus on meetings uh, the uh, same, basically the same, uh, what I mentioned before. And this constraints is not only uh, creating a barrier for the digital dividends use, but also uh, straightening the existing risks to the information security of the country defined by the concept of Republic of Tajikistan. Some of them were uh, provided uh, uh, on the bottom here on, later on the slides. Uh, the growth of number, uh, rapid growth of SUI providing standard infrastructure services at both national and transnational level, vulnerability of domestic critical communication infrastructure due to the single communication center, the technological dependence of the domestic ICT infrastructure on the single telecom equipment manufacturing, Hawaii. Hawaii. So by considering all of this, all of these factors, we provided uh, several recommendations for this block, it's development of the market, international communica communications market and increasing competitions, creation of a single public joint stock company or holding for the development of e-government with the private sector involvement. Uh, basically based on uh, special sector centers creating some kind of consortium of holding creation of it parks including extra extra territorial or virtual parks to attract international software companies and increase investment attractiveness uh, in this case it's absolutely necessary to create favorable conditions for the entrepreneurs of other countries and the IT companies without, from other countries without coming to the country could register in the country and play a role of the residents on behalf of our country. Simplification of the ICT licensing system and creation of infrastructure providers, multi-purpose use of existing infrastructures of uh, Barki Tajik, Pamir Energy, Suirohi Ohani Tajik to improve IT infrastructure. So next uh, uh, chapter or part of my presentation related to the cybersecurity, uh, which is also require uh, I would, uh, I would our request, attention. I would uh, for example, to, I would. Uh, according to the ITU Global Cybersecurity Report of 2018, 
Tajikistan has made progress in cybersecurity in recent years, but is still a very early stage and ranks uh, 107th out of 193 countries. Also in uh, Central uh, Asia, if you, you might see here on the graph the, in the percentage, Tajikistan is significantly behind Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan. In order to provide cybersecurity, there were certain measures in place to protect critical national infrastructure, like software and hardware. And as of today, uh, the uh, uh, responsible authority is the uh, main administration under the government of the Republic of Tajikistan. And the special measures uh, that are taken to prevent cyber attacks and respond from to cyber incidents uh, uh, already developed on the governmental level. In terms of the quick response group to the cyber incidents, we do have, we don't have them. Uh, from uh, the other side, uh, uh, we adopted uh, many important documents uh, that uh, providing measures for the protection of security. We can say that Tajikistan Information Security concept was adopted, availability of the capacity of private operators to ensure cybersecurity of their networks. Uh, this is the, 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 the this capacity could be used to provide cybersecurity of the critical infrastructure on the national level. We also have uh, uh, high need to improve multilateral partnership uh, or public-private partnership for cybersecurity at the national level. And uh, quick response group for the uh, cyber incidents are uh, not is not existing in Tajikistan. It's related to the public and independent uh, 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 areas. So as a result, the lack of the national strategy for cyber resilience and the absence of domestic independent search, weak stakeholder coordination, the monitoring and evaluation of international cybersecurity Indexes. Based on that, we recommend the establishment of the national and sectorial certs uh, in the national banking, uh, financial sector, development of the national strategy to secure critical uh, infrastructure uh, involving all stakeholders to ensure a cyber sustainable space and uh, using PPP to provide security on all different levels. So this is our key recommendations uh, based on uh, cyber security in our analysis. Next, next part of my presentation is uh, enabling uh, environment. This is the pretty much last component of uh, our analysis. Uh, then we will have the potential economic benefits. So in terms of enabling in environment, according to the World Bank uh, Doing Business 2020 report, Tajikistan has improved its position in this indicator and now ranking 106 from uh, 126 uh, in 2018. Uh, but beside, despite that, Tajikistan still lags behind all Central Asian countries. But we need to emphasize, emphasize that uh, there is no data on Turkmenistan. Uh, uh, according to the same report, business and innovation environment easy to start a business. Tajikistan is substantially improved uh, uh, on uh, starting, how is it so markedly and ranks 36 out of 190 countries in this indicator with a scoring of 93.2 scores. For example, registration of the commercial organization in Tajikistan 
on average takes about seven days, which is faster than the average for the Europe and Central Asia regions, uh, which is 11.9 days, almost 12 days it's possible to do. In terms of the development of uh, digital skills among society, digital skills and culture, according to the Global Competitiveness Index 2019 of WEF, Tajikistan ranks 57th out of 141 countries for its population uh, digital skills development. Since we don't have a data on Tajikistan, uh, Turkmenistan, Tajikistan is ahead of Kyrgyzstan in Central Asia, but behind the Kyrgyzstan, but not data for Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan. Uh, involvement of stakeholders in the development and implementation of the digital economy strategies. Due to the government involve all stakeholders in developing and implementing strategies programs for the digital economy. And uh, we are involved, we are members of many working groups on development of uh, uh, or drafting uh, normative legal acts. And in December 2010, there was a concept of the digital economy adopted in Tajikistan, which was drafted and presented by the uh, um, multi-sectorial uh, working group, where we have representative for, from different sectors. And it's actually, we are proud of the work of this group. There is also, uh, uh, and the responsible body for the digital uh, economy is the Ministry of Economy uh, under which they established the working group on implementation of this concept. And as of now, in Tajikistan, we do have uh, legislation promoting digital businesses development in the country, as you might see here. They are listed here in our report, for example, National Digital Identity Law, uh, uh, which is introduced in amendments of 2015, uh, law of uh, Republic of Tajikistan on data protection, uh, law on electronic tra transaction, electronic signature. Now still uh, we have a draft of uh, law on e-commerce, consumer protection in online sales, intellectual property rights law, uh, uh, cybersecurity, fintech, uh, law on fintech, and financial systems. Those will be the laws and normative acts that will facilitate development of the business in the country. And that was actually supported by our uh, respondents. In terms of SWOT analysis and enabling environment, so as a strong point, so strengths uh, uh, for successful transformation, we can say that the concept of the digital economy in the Republic of Tajikistan, uh, this document formalizes uh, paradigm of the digital economy in the country, which country that doesn't have direct connection to the uh, uh, regional trade centers. And it's identify very important principles for coordination of all the efforts to uh, create the analog uh, limitations to the digital benefits for our local economy. Legislative environment for the application of the digital ICT, national frameworks that including priority of international norms, uh, recognized and guarantee fair rules and equal opportunity for all actors uh, of the competitive uh, market economy which is uh, possible without independent regulators of the key uh, sectors. And one of the sector is ICT. Political will to straighten the transit potential of the domestic ICT markets. Uh, one of the four strategic calls, if you remember in the beginning, I was emphasizing it. A strategic goal of the countries is 
one of the goal of sustainable development of Tajikistan uh, till 2030 is strengthening the economic status of the country as a communicational transit uh, of the Central Asian region. So one of the key components, it's quite of uh, this quite ambitious goal is ICT and I apologize. Uh, could you please uh, finish your presentation within three minutes because we are a bit behind the time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Three minutes, I will finish. So political will supported by the practical steps, which is creating new opportunity for the expansion of ICT initiatives, for example, initiation and readiness to participate in regional infrastructure projects like CASA 1000, digital CASA, and the growing need for the digital ICT application and training of interdisciplinary staff everywhere nationwide. But at the same time, our local uh, experience of the implementation public initiative and uh, ICT oriented or fundamental for the needs of different spheres, showing the dominating narrow interest of some national institution in practice. So the next are the weaknesses they are uh, supporting the fairness weak implementation of adapted programs within the framework of achieving the goals of the national strategies and visions and unfavorable tax environment for ICT industries. So in terms of threats, growing conflicts of interest between the regulators and the different sectors discriminating against private licenses in favor of uh, state-owned enterprises. The growing gap between apps and uh, abusive enforcement practices and uh, unfavorable tax environment for businesses uh, in general. So based on that, I have several recommendations. I will uh, finish on this chapter. This will be the key points. Uh, and then next uh, part, we can uh, share just via emails. So we'll be sharing the whole information with you. Uh, so our recommendations is to conduct audit of the uh, regulations and uh, normative legal acts in the digital economy improve the investment climate for the development of digital economy, establishment of coordinator with the sufficient authority and capacity, and uh, of course, engaging international consultants for the development of the digital economy. So I guess I will stop here because I have all several remaining slides. Uh, this is closely related to the potential economic benefits that we can uh, discuss later on. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your attention. And as I might see here, the number of uh, uh, the number of the participants are uh, incre increasing. And also in Q and A, you will be able to find a lot of questions regarding your presentation. So please, uh, you could check, uh, uh, you could answer in the chat. You could answer in the chat Q&A yeah. session. Q&A, you might uh, press on Q&A link on the blog. And uh, there are a lot of questions uh, uh, regarding to your presentations. No, no, you can, you can just text. You can just uh, text them. No, no, excuse me. Yes, you can just uh, text them. Yes, via chat box. Yeah. You can just tape tape your answers. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mohammadi Abdullah, for an interesting and comprehensive research details. As my colleague uh, just mentioned, that there are a lot of questions about your uh, presentation in the Q&A section. Uh, I, I would request you to just go through and then I will give you a floor again to respond on the questions when, when you read uh, all the questions. 
then I will give you floor to respond to the questions because there are a lot of questions and I would, I would just want you to read once and then I will give you a floor to respond to the questions. So uh, our uh, next speaker is uh, Aziz John uh, Azimi, founder of uh, Tajrab.ai, uh, the first artificial intelligence lab in Central Asia. Aziz John. Thank you very much, Shaukat. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Great. I will share my screen for a presentation and uh, we can get started. Oops. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes, yes, we can see. Great. Dear colleagues, uh, good afternoon. I will do present uh, my uh, slides uh, in uh, Russian, um, some of the slides in English. Oh, sorry, I will switch to English. Distinguished colleagues and the audience about artificial intelligence and how we have a vision for utilizing AI as a foundation for leap forward development in Tajikistan. So um, Dr. Alters, when he was speaking uh, earlier uh, on this panel, mentioned the term leapfrog digital development. And I want to unpack that a little bit, right? So, so what do we mean by leapfrog development? Traditionally in economic Excuse development- Excuse me, I can, I, can, I can barely hear. Catch up is so, developing- So Aziz, Aziz John, sorry, uh, if you can just select the interpretation uh, English, then our, uh, our translators no, will- no. Uh, I think we can. Uh, it's okay. We can. Yeah, I can hear him, but his voice is echoing. Maybe he would use the headphones. I apologize for interruption. Yeah. Sure. Okay. I'll bring this over closer to myself. Though. Can you guys hear me fine? Is that good? Thank you very much. It's better. Thank you. We can get through this together. Sure. We can get through this together. I promise you, I'll be. I'll be shorter. Okay. Uh, going back to my screen then, uh, and I believe someone is not muted. It'll be great if if people can you know mute. Um, but going to our, uh, you know, uh, topic again. So catch up versus leapfrog. Um, catch up is when you have developing countries um, simulating the development trajectory of the developed countries. So what do we mean? For example, in the 60s and 70s, you had development of manufacturing in the Asian tigers, South Korea, Taiwan, other countries. And by simply replicating the development trends of, at the time, developed countries, they were able to attain high growth rates. But today there is an alternative theory that is uh, being uh, widely adopted across the world and it's the leapfrog theory. And the leapfrog theory says that instead of focusing and simply replicating on uh, the conventional sectors such as manufacturing, agriculture, developing countries should instead focus on the most developed sectors of technology. And by adopting the most advanced technology, they can actually leapfrog ahead in development and go straight to the level of developed countries. What is the case in point of that? The case in point is Kenya. Kenya is, a, is an interesting case. Uh, and I believe that you know, experts from the World Bank have done numerous studies showcasing how you know, tremendous the growth in Kenya has been. Kenya is a country where 83% of the population is actually connected to financial services. And that's a remarkable percentage. That's, that's literally on the level of developed countries. How has Kenya attained that? Not by replicating the Western banking model, but instead by adopting mobile technology. Companies like M-Pesa, by bringing financial services to mobile technology, connection of it, have enabled even people in rural areas of Kenya to have access to financial services. And this is a case where a country like Kenya, by adopting the latest trends in technology, in this case, digital payments, was able to leapfrog development as opposed to focusing on conventional manufacturing or, or agriculture, right? And over the last 10 years, Kenya's GDP grow, uh, has doubled. Uh, and obviously correlation isn't causation, right? But digital sector is one of the fast and grow, fastest growing sectors in Kenya. So this goes to show um, how leapfrog is actually, uh, you know, has many cases in point. Now, how do we see that in Tajikistan, right? And, and I'm gonna switch to the work that our organization does in a second. Overall, about artificial intelligence, we should know that it's a pretty big sphere, right? You can look, you can see that there's many sub branches, machine learning, natural language processing, expert systems. Most of AI today is actually in this space, in machine learning, which is machines that are able to um, think and act like humans uh, after analyzing data. And that's the basics of AI and machine learning, which is you have some sort of data, you analyze the data, you build models, and those models are able to automate certain human tasks. That's it. But if we look at the impact of AI, um, PwC recently did a study that showed that by 2030, AI will add $15.7 trillion to the global GDP. 
That makes artificial intelligence the single largest commercial opportunity globally today. And if you look at countries that, that can win a share of that price, China stands out. China is anticipated to have 26% in additional GDP just from deployment of artificial intelligence. And today, when we look at deployment, you know, real world cases of AI, we see it everywhere. We see it in Siri, right? The, the assistant that um, Apple has. Uh, Self-driving cars, Waymo is an example. Netflix. Um, I believe someone is not muted. Uh, can I ask again? Someone forgot to turn off the mic. Um, uh -huh, no worries. You can still hear me, right? I think everybody is muted now. Aziz. Hello? Okay, great. Thank you. And Waymo is another example that Google is using computer vision, which is another you know, part of AI, to introduce self-driving cars. Another simple case is Netflix. By using machine learning, right, Netflix is able to personalize content recommendation. Another case is TikTok. TikTok is you know, an incredible case of how personalized recommendations can actually lead to incredible user growth. So AI is everywhere. It's the present. Um, but at the same time, what I should note is that there's also a lot of hype around artificial intelligence. Left and right companies are saying they're deploying AI, but at its core, AI is dependent on data. And there's this great principle that I really adore called garbage in, garbage out. If you have garbage data, the model you build will give you garbage output. So it's really important to focus on the data quality in order to have good sort of de uh, deployment of artificial intelligence. Now about factors of growth. Why has AI come to the forefront of development today and not 50 years ago? There are two factors that explain that. First, it's the volume of data. So if you can see, you know, just how much data is generated globally, in 2020, we had about over 40 zettabytes of data, and one zettabyte is basically a billion terabytes. Look at this explosive growth rate, right? We're having an increasing rate of uh, data generation from mobile phones, from laptops, from sensors, and this level of adoption is increasing year by year. So the more data you have, the more accurate AI systems you're able to develop. The second factor is computer processing power, right? Computing power. Now we have GPUs, graphing processing units, that are able to process data at a significantly faster rate than ever before in human history. So these two factors combined, the volume of data and the computing power make AI something that is a, uh, able to be deployed today, not just in the future, but today in the world. Now, touch up AI, what do we do? So this is our lab in Fujian, a city in, in Tajikistan. We are the first AI lab in Central Asia. We launched our lab in November, 2019. Uh, our team is based in Tajikistan and we have mentors from Stanford. Um, I was at the time uh, doing my second year MBA at Stanford when we just launched you know, touch up AI. So for me, it was very special that a country like Tajikistan that is nominally seen as you know, a low income country just developing was able to already leapfrog in AI and open the first AI lab in Central Asia. Uh, we won a global grant from the Islamic Development Bank. We were one of 32 winners from over 4,300 participants to launch our lab. And we also became a finalist of Google's AI Impact Challenge last year. And TouchUp AI believes in you know, sort of two dimensions of work. We educate people and we build products. People and products form the foundation for our work because we believe that if we indeed want to leapfrog in AI as a country, as a nation, we have to have talented people who are making awesome products. That's the simple thesis we believe in. And if you look at you know, our, our deployment, the first deployment, the first product we built was in financial services, in FinTech. Why? We adopted a methodology called design thinking, which basically says that before building a product, you know, even if you're a genius, you've got to go and talk to regular people. Talk to them, interview them, find user needs, what they actually need in their lives, and then tailor your solution in order to activate those user needs. So we started talking to uh, you know, consumers, consumers in Dushanbe, in Fujian, you know, across Tajikistan. And then we started talking to credit experts because we knew that banks have a lot of data. So we figured you know, if, if we're gonna deploy AI, it should be in financial services. And our interviews showcased the following. We found that if you are an average Tajik citizen who goes to a regular Tajik bank to get a micro loan, you know, let's say loans up to $1,000, you spend around one to three days to get back a response. Not the loan, but to get back a response. Why? Because of the following factors. First, documentation. Vast majority of banks in Tajikistan, even for a micro loan, they demand salary statements, they demand documentation related to collateral, related to your relatives, etc. 
There's lots of documentation. Second, uh, there's a uh, slowdown in the process. In order to get a micro loan of, let's say, $500, you have to get approval from a credit expert and then from a credit committee. And that two-step process has lots of bottlenecks. And when we saw these problems, we figured this is the area where AI can be deployed in order to automate decision making on micro loans. Um, and for banks, this is really important, especially because banks are spending eight resources to service a set of their portfolio, right? The 20 really small micro loan, a credit expert spends two to three days analyzing them, which is really inefficient. That credit expert better spend time marketing and, and selling the product, right? Or, or servicing bigger clients. Now, when we see solutions, right? What are the solutions to issues of uh, analyzing micro loan uh, applicants? There's scoring. Scoring is a traditional methodology. Um, it's been widespread in the developed world. It's also you know, present in Tajik banks. The best example of scoring is FICO, right? In the United States, where there's a credit score that's assigned to consumers. The problem with traditional scoring is that it discriminates against first time clients. Why? Because credit scores, they generally are based on credit history. And if you don't have a credit history, then you basically are left out of the financial services system, right? And that's a major problem that we see in developed countries as well. Another problem is that credit scoring systems, uh, they usually have uh, linear relationships. So they believe that you know, the consumer data is linearly related to each other. So for example, income, age, other factors, they have linear relationships. We have seen numerous research studies that prove that the variables around consumers are not linear. So actually a person can have a completely different income level and a completely different age. And the way those two factors are connected is not linear. They can be switching at different rates for different customers. So we see that traditional scoring methodologies that are present in, in Tajik banks, they are outdated. And this is true for other countries as well in the region. So what do we do? We looked at research and we saw that, for example, if you look at actual data of consumers, let's say there's variable X and there's output Y, Y is whether the person will give the loan back or not, X can be any factor like income, the relationship is non-linear, right? But linear models, linear scoring models that are adopted by most banks across the world, they assume a linear relationship, right? Either it's a good credit or a bad credit. Here's the power of machine learning, right? Machine learning can actually go deeper and analyze and come to um, uh, uncovering those non-linear relationships. So we decided to apply machine learning to this issue and we created a simple credit scoring software based on artificial intelligence. This is the interface of our program. So a credit expert, they would ask for 10 pieces of data from a consumer, right? Things like age, uh, amount of credit, the purpose of credit, what region they're from, how many times they've gotten the credit in the bank, et cetera. And these 10 categories of data can lead to a single response. Now to get to this response, our software analyzes data of hundreds of thousands of consumers who have previously gotten loans at Tajik banks across the country. And it took us uh, four months to develop this product, which was a fairly quick you know, turnaround, only three people working part-time. So this shows to you the power of machine learning that if you have the right data, and most importantly, the right process, you can launch products at a fairly quick pace. How do we get here? Well, we've deployed two principles, efficiency and equity. Yes, we're a commercial startup. We're commercializing our products, and that is helping banks in the following ways. First, by deploying machine learning and using this product, banks are able to reduce their operational costs. They're no longer spending 80% of resources on 20% of loans. They can use a credit scoring software to automatically give decisions on applications for micro loans and move on to servicing higher, let's say, um, uh, threshold consumers. Second, the flow of applications. By making the process of issuing microloans faster, banks are able to service more customers, and this brings them additional revenue. And third is accuracy. By utilizing machine learning, banks are able to more accurately predict credit worthiness than traditional scoring models. But the second mission of our company is social mission, right? What's the social effect? The social effect is that if we're able to you know, deploy machine learning at a systemic level in Tajik banks, we see two things happen. First, we're increasing access to financial services because clients without credit history, mostly you know, the youth, they're now able to access credit because our credit scoring system is able to analyze first time clients as well. And second, it makes the process much faster. So no longer do you know, uh, consumers in Tajikistan have to wait two to three days to get a response on a loan. They can get them fairly quickly. Now, uh, how do we build our product? We first got a database of clients on microloans. We analyzed uh, that database with different machine learning models. 
we built an algorithm that combines you know, different models into a single software. And we started piloting that software with our banking partners. I'll tell about that in a second. And now we're deploying our product in real banks with real customers. And it's the beauty of, of the machine learning that we're able to do this at a fairly quick speed. Who are our partners? Right now, we have five partners in Tajikistan. Uh, these banks form cumulatively uh, the, the largest share in microloans in the country. And we signed NDAs with them to access their data and to build uh, the credit scoring software. Our database includes data on 532,000 clients over a five-year period, 2015 till 2020. And we've built 10 common uh, variables that are um, available for each of these customers. And our database is anonymous. So we guarantee user privacy by ensuring that we do not have access to their personal identity and data. Now, when we tested our model, what did we see? There are two indicators that you can use to evaluate uh, credit scoring models. One is accuracy, right, touch list. Another is AUC, area under the curve. For accuracy, our bank partners, their accuracy was around 77 to 86%. Our accuracy for a logistic regression model, which is you know, a basic linear model, was around 90.8%, right? So this shows to you that well, the added value from machine learning is actually quite substantial, even if it's a linear model like Logger. Now, AUC is more important. AUC is the main metric used to evaluate credit scoring models. And conventional wisdom says that if your machine learning model for credit scoring has AUC of 0.7 and above, then the model is ready for deployment. It's basically a model that's good enough to be used by banks. Our partner, one of them actually had an AUC for their low grade model. It was around 0.67, which is below the threshold. All of our models that we've built using machine learning, such as XGB classifier, you know, random forest ensemble, all of them consistently show above 0.7 AUC, you know, even reaching 0.75, which is pretty phenomenal, right? Given the context of Tajikistan. And our accuracy is uh, stable above 90%. So this shows to you that machine learning is significantly outperforming banks in their capacity for credit scoring of microloans. Now about deployment, uh, Spitamen Bank became the first bank in Tajikistan's history to deploy machine learning uh, because of our product. On April 1st, and this was not a joke for April Fools, right? On April 1st, we launched uh, our credit scoring software in two branches of Spitamen Bank in Dushanbe. Spitamen Bank has committed 1 million somoni to give out loans with our credit scoring model. And now uh, what is the result? We see that it takes 15 minutes for consumers in Dushanbe, in the two branches of Spitamen Bank, to get a response on their microloan application. They come to a bank, they talk to a credit expert, the credit expert enters their data, their data on our credit scoring software. Our software uses machine learning to approve or reject the model, and the response is given in total. The whole process takes about 15 minutes. Obviously, it takes longer to actually get you know, the money because there's processes around opening an account, et cetera, but those are beyond our work. Our work was always automating the decision on the loan, and we've done that already with, with, uh, with uh, Spiderman Bank. Now, um, basically, when we see on, on next steps, four more banks will be deploying our credit scoring software. And by the end of the summer, we'll have five banks, uh, major banks in microloan segment, using machine learning in giving responses uh, you know, on, on microloan applications. And this is something unprecedented. Because even in developed countries, yes, you have digital banks, you have banks that use machine learning. But I don't know a case of a country where machine learning is used by major players, by the biggest banks in microloan segment. So this would be a leapfrog case where hopefully, if we're successful and we show good results, Tajikistan will be the first case, I believe, globally where machine learning is used on a systemic level to you know, um, make decisions on microloan applications. What's the next horizon for us? Next horizon is alternative data, right? We wanna collect non-traditional data in order to further improve access of credit for consumers. What kind of data? It can be online payments, it can be behavioral data, it can be remittances, right? And all of these data points, they increase the accuracy of our machine learning model. Right now we're working with one bank in order to pilot collection of alternative data, including psychometric data through questionnaires and tests. And you know, the more data we collect that's alternative, I believe the better accuracy we'll achieve with our machine learning model. And eventually banks will be having greater profitability and consumers will be having greater access at a greater um, speed to financial services. Now, what we saw was that, you know, this, this was about products, talking about people, right? How do we nurture people? Uh, banks that are partnering with us said, you know, as is John, great product, you know, historic things, amazing. But who will actually help us deploy AI and machine learning in other spheres of banking, right? In marketing in personalizing content, et cetera. So we decided to build uh, an AI academy, which already now is working. Uh, it's based in Dushanbe in Hujan. 
There are 150 students. There is also an online format with an online curriculum for our AI Academy and with students from Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan joining our AI Academy. It's the first such academy in the region of Central Asia. And uh, these students for four months, they will be learning fundamentals of statistics, programming in Python and machine learning. And at the end, top 50 graduates will undergo paid internships in 10 companies in Tajikistan, ranging across telecom, financial services, and, and consulting industries. It was very important for us to secure employment at first and then start enrolling students, because now we're proving that there's demand for machine learning jobs in Tajikistan. And in the future, we want to create a they will remain in Pakistan and they will work for a global company because the demand for machine learning outsourcing is incredibly high in the global economy today. And a, a success story, right, of our students. These two students are both 16 years old. This is Samandar uh, and uh, this is Nazir John. They're both graduates of our AI Academy in Fujian. They recently built a face recognition algorithm using basic machine learning. This is not something advanced, right? They use the tools of deep learning to construct this based on open libraries. And they're commercializing their product. They're selling it to one of the local banks. And this is an incredible success story where we see that students who are 16 years old, right? They're not only getting jobs. For example, Samandar is now an intern. He's getting a salary at a local bank in Fuja, but they're also building products that they're able to commercialize. So basically a startup, right? Our worry is that soon, hopefully, Tajab they will have uh, you know, graduates launching startups that will compete with us. So that, that's a worry that uh, is, a, is a great you know, sort of happiness for us as well. And what are our long-term goals? I, I wanna give a special you know, gratitude to um, Mr. Sherly Kabir, the Minister of Industry and New Technologies, who visited our office just a few weeks ago. Uh, Mr. Kabir has provided tremendous support to us and for me personally you know returning from stanford and just finishing my thesis at harvard it's been incredibly encouraging that you know the minister has dedicated not only time but also support to making our vision of tajikistan as an ai hub of central asia uh, converting it to reality and the minister has supported our goal of uh, you know attaining leapfrog development in tajikistan by deploying ai at an industrial scale um, and uh, our goal is that you know for our credit scoring software we want to export to other countries in asia we see that this is an incredibly big market opportunity and there's very few products that match our product uh, using machine learning. So by the end of 2021, we want to start exporting our uh, machine learning based credit score scoring system to other countries in Asia. And I believe there'll be a, the first case where we will hopefully raise venture capital funding um, from uh, VC funds and showcase that a startup in Tajikistan with three part-time employees, but a big ambition can actually attain global level development uh, at its speed. Uh, and uh, the last thing I want to mention is the national AI strategy. Minister Kabir has approved uh, creating a national AI strategy for Tajikistan that will complement documents that were already mentioned in this panel. So we have a digital economy concept, but this strategy document is actually, I would say, you know, revolutionary. Why? Because right now there are 50 countries globally that have AI strategies. The average GDP per capita of a country that has an AI strategy is over $30,000, which means that this is an exclusively developed country club, right? You're a developed country, yeah, you have uh, good resources, you have good infrastructure, you have data centers, you have computing power, you're building an AI strategy. But if you look at low income countries, not a single country globally that has a GDP per capita of less than $1,000 has an AI strategy. So now that we're beginning work on our strategy, once Tajikistan hopefully adopts its AI strategy, uh, Tajikistan will become the first low income country globally and the first country overall in Central Asia to have a national AI strategy and uh, we will start implementation you know, of our vision. Just last week, Minister Kabir uh, and I met with the uh, heads of universities, technical universities, and now we're going to, um, you know, including AI as a major in the universities across Tajikistan. Uh, one university in Hujan has already included an AI major. They have a master's program. They're launching a bachelor's program and scaling that program, you know, across different universities, I believe will create a greater talent pool. And in regards to, you know, just some concluding remarks, um, data center as well, right? Minister Kabir's vision is to launch a data center very shortly in Tajikistan, that will provide an incentive for companies like ours to have access to greater data and use that to improve our um, machine learning models. So to summarize, you know, touch up AI, again, small company, but big ambitions and a, a forum like this enables us to bring our message to a greater audience. And I hope that, you know, you will share us in, in the dream of uh, Tajikistan becoming an AI nation. And most importantly, you will support us in the implementation of this vision. Thank you all very much. I appreciate your time. Uh, thank you, Aziz John Nazimi, for an inspiring presentation. You are a role model for the youth of uh, Tajikistan, so keep shining and inspiring. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Anatoly Motkin 
founder and president of Strategy Center for a New Economy, who will talk about how to create an IT ecosystem in Tajikistan. Thank you very much, Shaukat. Thank you uh, very much, the representative office of the European Union in Tajikistan and the World Bank for the event. And it is a great um, honor for us to participate in this event. Indeed, we believe that Tajikistan has a great uh, potential, great capacity in the development of the IT sector. And uh, traditionally, Tajikistan has been the center of culture and science in this region. I'd like to thank Mr. Ibadulloyev for a very interesting and detailed presentation and the analysis of the current situation with certain recommendations about what's happening in Tajikistan. In reality, the presentation that I would like to show you is called um, how to create a modern IT infrastructure in Tajikistan. But um, I think it will be more about the following. What can strategist as the center of a new economy that is involved in the development of the economy of knowledge in the Eurasian region would be ready and willing to do in Tajikistan? The Strategist to Global Minds Initiative program is a program that consists of several stages and it allows, even in the countries where the IT industry is still in the embryo stage, uh, to turn it into a dynamically developing and organically developing sector. A strategist is ready to start implementing its Global Minds Initiative in Tajikistan, and it's aimed at the development of a sector of economic technologies. It will lead to the firm. Anatoly, I do apologize, but I would like to interrupt you. Do you have a presentation? You cannot see it? Um, Just a second, please let me launch. Uh, Just a couple of seconds and let me share. Yes, we can. Right. Thank you. So apologies for the technical hiccup. So the program is aimed at the establishment and the development of the sector of information technologies. And the result of the implementation of the strategies program will be the formation of a group of young professionals, entrepreneurs, and the workers of the IT sphere effectively integrated in the global economic and production processes. Tajikistan will turn from a consumer of the IT products to the producer of such products. Uh, the Global Minds Initiative program consists of several stages, as I told you. First is, of course, the training. We lean on our cooperation, multi-year cooperation with major IT companies that are international IT and engineering companies. And uh, what have we devised? We don't split the training process away from the creation of jobs. We're asking the companies that train the people to hire people on a remote basis from the countries where they live. And this uh, prevents the brain drain from the countries. Furthermore, people that uh, train in our programs, as soon as they complete uh, their training, receive a job offer from the companies that are training them. We're also involved in the development of the startup industry in these countries in cooperation with uh, several accelerators from the Silicon Valley that help the local guys that have their ideas, that have their startups to formulate their ideas, to shape them up, how to make sure these ideas are clear and understandable and how can they attract financing for their ideas. We're also helping, and this is an important component for the establishment of the ecosystem in Tajikistan. So we study the local legislation and we help make sure that it is in compliance with the best regional experience. This is what we've done in Georgia last year, where we managed, thanks to the fact that we conducted a tax reform to attract international companies and start our activities in Georgia and hire local guys from there. We're also involved in um, 
motivating discussions with the world IT leaders in the countries where we work. And in this case, we're talking about Tajikistan. So these are the founders of the Viber Messenger to the guys working in Amazon and other companies. Now, the strategist uh, changing economy, changing society report is the report that we have developed about how the IT industry in the post-Soviet countries looks like. This is an important report because its main purpose, although it's a, a shallow one, is to convince decision makers, financial decision makers, that the IT industry has and deserve a special treatment and it should be developing separately because in reality, there is future behind it. Uh, it is emphasized that Tajikistan has improved its laws and regulations on the way towards a digital transformation. Tajikistan approved the concept of electronic government and created the Council of ICT under the president. At the same time, there's insufficient uh, level of development and too much regulation. This is also something that we discussed in the telecommunications sector. And this prevents dynamic development in the of the IT industry in the country. Tajikistan has joined the World Bank project Digital CASA. This is important because the World Bank is a partner. It's a knowledge partner and that we work with in many countries. And this project uh, opens up a new future for the countries of Central Asia, including the development of infrastructure. As a result of the implementation of the project, the population of Tajikistan, including remote areas, will be provided with broadband internet access. And this is important because IT industry is also about the equality of opportunities. So when a person has a large intellectual resources, have the same opportunities, even if they live in the rural areas, they have the same opportunities as people that live in Dushanbe. There will be transit of data from Tajikistan to Europe and Asia. And um, I know we don't have much time, um, but I've already shared this presentation and digital CASA is very important for the development of IT industry in Tajikistan. What does Tajikistan lack the, for the speedy development of the IT cluster? Advantages include availability of youth with quality fundamental education in uh, precise sciences, a great capacity for IT projects for the domestic market. And that does not only include the banking sector, first of all, for state agencies and state companies, they are the main consumers in this part prospects for the development of the transit digital hub within the framework of the J digital CASA project. Disadvantages, a uh, low number of specialists with the experience of working in the, the most in-demand programming languages, but that's not enough. We don't only need coders, we also need people that know how to communicate with international clients. This is what we have faced and uh, gotten over in Georgia, a lot of talented programmers that didn't have the experience of working with international uh, clients. So it's uh, the question of the chicken or the hen and the egg. So you need specialists that will train local guys. Then insufficient uh, regulation, not a very attractive regulation of the IT sector and insufficient experience on part of local IT entrepreneurs to work with the Western customers in the promotion of their services on the Western markets. How can the Strategist uh, Global Minds Initiative help Tajikistan for modern IT industry? First step, opening a training center. This is what I refer to. In reality, we are ready to agree with several international IT companies uh, that uh, first it will be a pilot and then they will be able to create several jobs, first of all, in Tajikistan. And then the guys that will pass entrance exams and the training will be in English that will have basic knowledge of algorithms in eight months of after eight months of training at the level of team leaders that will start they will be able to start working in this company without leaving their country while continuing working at their main place of employment or studying in the university after the studies they will be able to combine work and studies second engaging international or attracting international companies to the country. As soon as there is a base of specialists, Tajikistan will become attractive for international IT companies. This will be a known uh, company for them. The strategist organized a series of activities to engage some companies and attract them to the Tajik market. In Georgia, for instance, this resulted in several companies opening branches. And in the first year, they will create more than a thousand new jobs in IT 
In Georgia, there is only three and a half million people population, so that's significant. Uh, these companies will be orientated towards the export of the most modern IT services, and they will become the foundation of the future IT industry in Tajikistan. We understand that people working in these companies uh, have uh, reached a certain level, and in one year they can train five lower level level coders. So that's a um, pyramid-like development. Uh, and then access of local companies and startups to the global financial markets. I will not read this. You can take a look at this in your free time. But we have colossal experience in helping local guys, local startups enter international markets in a qualified fashion, start cooperating with the Silicon Valley and get investments. This is very important because this does um, provide opportunities to the country to develop regardless of who is around the country, who are the neighbors. This is the only commodity that you can sell regardless of the distance and very fast. As a result of the Global Mines Initiative project in Tajikistan, we will generate momentum for the formation of a new export-oriented sector of the economy. Recommendations will be provided to improve legislation in the IT sphere, yet again in cooperation with the state agencies, World Bank and the EU representative office. Tajikistan will significantly satisfy its own IT needs by using local production. I'm confident that right now, a lot of money is spent on purchasing foreign products and there will be a group of IT entrepreneurs integrated in the global IT ecosystem and thousands of young graduates will be employed in the fastest growing sector of the global economy, staying in Tajikistan. Thank you for your attention. And once again, I hope that we will continue our cooperation. And thank you again, organizers of this event for a very interesting event. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Natalie Motkin and Strategist for your great support in organizing this, uh, this conference. Uh, our, our last speaker is Kate Gromoa, co-founder of Women in Digital Transformation digital development consultant at the World Bank, who will talk about digital skills initiatives for Tajikistan, priorities and opportunities. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, and thank you so much for the opportunity to talk today. And uh, yeah, just let me quickly share my presentation here. I hope you can see it well. Yes, yes, we can. Thank you. Um, so um, I know that we are a little bit over, over the time now, but uh, so I will try to be uh, um, very specific on our findings and recommendations, uh, which we did uh, um, this digital skills analysis within their uh, World Bank team. Um, and uh, um, basically I would like to discuss and show the results of this, uh, um, of our work and, uh, um, ideas, I will share our ideas for their um, interventions and projects, which is uh, we can run together. So this is a special uh, reason why we talk about digital skills today, uh, because for one of the main barrier for digital transformation is the lack of uh, uh, digital skills uh, within the population in the country. Um, and uh, the current situation in um, Tajikistan is kind of uh, um, on the edge we see that uh, uh, there are positive and, but there are also negative trends in the country. And we would like to highlight both of these uh, trends and just think what can be done in a short period of time to overcome these uh, negative trends. What we see now that uh, according to their global innovation index, the overall human cap uh, capability development are kind of uh, um, stagnated if it's not declining and uh, um, the decline, especially worse in decline, happened within the last uh, couple of years. And uh, for instance, from 2019, the drop was uh, several scores. Uh, in 2019, the rank was, uh, um, country was on the 87th place out of uh, uh, 129 countries, and now on to uh, 109 place, which is, uh, um, I really would like to highlight uh, and to draw the attention to this uh, worsened sig signal in their um, overall capacity development, human capacity development. But there are some positive uh, trends and uh, um, there are some positive foundations for the future growth and uh, um, capacity development. For instance, there, graduates, uh, there is a positive growth in the graduates, uh, in the number of graduates in science and engineering schools. 
Um, and uh, the country is actually uh, doing good uh, uh, comparing to uh, some of the neighbor countries. There are also the positive trend in uh, um, overall country ability to attract uh, talent and uh, listening for uh, as a drone, I do understand why is that. Uh, though their uh, country capacity to grow talent within the country is uh, a little bit uh, um, at the problem now. So there's a requirement uh, for the focus to uh, have strong educational programs uh, to ensure that the capacity are grown within the country. And uh, they see that there is a positive trend in overall work with their uh, women and this gender parity gaps and covering this gender parity gaps, uh, which is, uh, which is uh, quite important. And I will talk about this a little bit uh, late in the presentation. So just to concentrate more on the current bottlenecks and potential intervention. <clears throat> and uh, here I would like to spend a little bit more time talking uh, on the bottlenecks. Uh, so we know that there are many uh, digital skills programs and initiatives in the countries, but uh, there's still overall uh, lack of overall um, digital uh, literacy for the entire population. And as I said, that uh, digital skills is a key driver for digital transformation because it creates the demand side uh, for digital services, digital products, uh, uh, their development of the business. So do, not having their high level of uh, overall digital literacy in the country won't give the opportunity to grow this, uh, um, uh, to grow digital transformation, to, to run digital transformation. They see that the overall uh, schools and university curriculums are not uh, uh, future-proof, not up to date, and it's end up in um, having limited and not enough number of digital specialists, especially with the advanced skills. And here again, if we talk about uh, AI Academy, this is the opportunities for uh, people to to uh, grow and their skills into their um, advanced uh, uh, technologies, uh, but it's not also enough. It's just good to have this type of approach across the country and broad this kind of initiatives. Um, there is a lack uh, of the demand for digital skills in public sector. And uh, um, of course, and you probably know this uh, very well that there are um, uh, divide digital uh, skills gaps between rural and uh, urban population is quite uh, big and it's actually widening the digital divide in the country. So what is possible to do uh, in this current situation um, in their short term perspective? Of course, it's uh, digital infrastructure and connectivity. It's working with their um, digital, uh, the, the school curriculums uh, and skill frameworks. It's important to bring this uh, new digital content uh, uh, for the broader awareness in local languages and to work and train teachers so they ha have confidence in using and teaching the digital technologies. It's important to run digital inclusive initiatives for women and uh, vulnerable group of people. We cannot have half of their country population out of their digital transformation. It's important to have this focus uh, programs on, on women. It's quite uh, necessary to have a capacity building initiative for public sector, for government officials, because these are people who will be driving, will be the leaders of digital transformation on the government side. They do need to understand how to implement uh, um, digital technologies uh, for the country grow. And it's important to have very sectorial focus uh, digital uh, schools and programs, uh, cooperation between industry and academia, the partnerships uh, are uh, crucial and necessary. But what is very important now in this current stage in the country is really their leadership. So to have this cooperation among government and academia and private sector to assess the current market demands to map all uh, digital available digital skills programs and actors, create digital capacity framework for Tajikistan and launch education training programs with the development partners. And um, the examples uh, what uh, uh, we uh, heard today from Anatoly and Aziz on how it can be done with their partnership with the private sector is just great examples uh, of the leadership uh, with the specific uh, initiatives uh, on, on the specific uh, topics. So, so I think it's just a great 
great uh, um, opportunity for the country now just to grow these kind of initiatives. But also just to think broader on on the potential um, what what else can be done or how we can approach uh, the topics, for instance, with the capacity development uh, in the pro uh, for the uh, public officials. It's very important to think now what are the skills and knowledge which are required for the uh, public officials to run digital transformation and uh, how and what the uh, country need to teach the, the um, government officials. It's important to understand how to use open data and how to use data for overall data-driven decision-making uh, process. It's very important for them to understand how the legal system should uh, look like and work uh, to support digital transformation. It's quite important to see for uh, look for the international case studies and how other countries uh, uh, went through their transformation, especially on in the initial stages. Work uh, and uh, cooperate with the private sector, but uh, also have digital and data skills and cyber skills for each of their uh, digital uh, public officials. So just to make sure these people do feel and understand what is uh, uh, needed and what is happening in digital space. So they don't, um, they're not afraid to, to run this uh, and support their um, transformation. So as I said, their inclusion and specifically women inclusion is an important topic. and. Um, and why we talk separately on women, about women programs, and this is one of the example World Bank uh, had uh, um, in Kosovo, this women in online work. Um, so why it's important is because having um, focus specifically on women engagement and women in education usually bring better results than, uh, the, than the programs are mixed and blended. That's many, many researchers showed that the um, performance and efficiency in only women cohorts for technical education is higher because uh, it limits their uh, male peer, uh, peer pressure on women. It's um, also uh, give more flexibility to adjust to uh, overall women requirements from their time perspective. So women can uh, include the family care responsibilities with the education. Uh, it's also important to adjust programs uh, and bring them closer to women because women usually have uh, less opportunity to travel far for the education and uh, for training programs. So this is uh, one of the examples where their um, specific technical program was delivered on the municipal level for women just to ensure that uh, they can engage into their um, technical education. It showed very positive and, uh, results and uh, had many offers and women employed not only in Kosovo, but in other European countries. So it's uh, one of the example which can be um, adjusted and uh, um, analyzed for um, Tajikistan needs. Some examples of uh, women participants. And it's also important to have inclusive education for people uh, with disabilities. And this is one of the example from Vietnam we had. Uh, and uh, why Vietnam? Because there are uh, more than 90% of uh, uh, working, people, working age people um, with disabilities do not have marketable professional skills. Uh, and it's, uh, this specific program was an interesting example how the cooperation with the education, private sector and the government helped to not only to build these skills, but overcome stigma for their uh, employment uh, and enrich people with their technical knowledge, but also soft skills uh, training. So to make sure that people end up being uh, employable and uh, uh, in the cooperation with their um, private and sector with the employers, they manage to uh, provide this uh, support net uh, so that people can get after the trainings and get employed and uh, had a very uh, positive feedback on the, uh, after the training. So there are many, many different examples how these uh, um, difficult issues with their education for different group of people are uh, tackled in different countries. I think we are now at a good position, countries in a good position to bring uh, this expertise, like uh, like Anatoly talk about, they experience from other countries, 
together with their support uh, from private sector and uh, finance from the partner, um, international partners, to just ensure that the country is up and leapfrog in its digital transformation and support this uh, demand for digital uh, skills, which is huge now. So this will be it from my side. And I will happy to share the presentation and um, answer separately on the questions. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kate Gromova, for an interesting uh, presentation. As uh, you can see, uh, we are receiving so many questions. And so far, we have already responded uh, answers uh, and comments for around 40 questions. And there are still a lot of questions coming. So I just want to give a floor to uh, uh, Mohammadi again. Uh, if you would like to respond uh, on, on some of the questions in our chat box. And, and uh, if you wanted to comment uh, uh, in three minutes, please uh, wrap up and then give your, uh, your answers and your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. In principle, I've been answering in this chat box to the questions that I got. If there is anything else, then go ahead. Um, excellent. So uh, I can I can ask you a couple of a uh, couple of uh, questions. Uh, one of the question is how you measure the increase in labor productivity in companies where the technology has already been introduced as success stories and a basis for calculating digital GDP. Uh, how? Oh, right. There it is. Success story. Well, frankly speaking, we've never measured that. But it is an interesting topic. It is an interesting idea that we should uh, give some thought. OK, excellent. Uh, well, most frequently, it's like about a 50% productivity increase, hypothetically. Hypothetically, I calculated it once, and this is what I got. But yet again, we need to have detailed studies of this. Frankly speaking, I've never done measurements of that kind. Okay, uh, thank you, Mamadi. Uh, another question is, uh, what barriers do you think exist in terms of running a paperless business with each other? Well, I already answered this question. The main barrier is um, regulation. Regulatory norms Besides having an electronic version, besides having a digital database, uh, regulators demand, and the controlling authorities demand paper copies of the same documents. Also, a lack of transparency, and of course, lack of any tax advantages for the companies that would like to be involved in paperless work. And then yet again, tax burden and the lack of staff. That is also an additional factor that has an impact on this. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Mohammadi, and thank you very much to all the distinguished speakers. It's it is a very very interesting uh, conference, and I can see you can see the importance of digital economy and the interest. Uh, uh, out there because uh, the amount of 65 questions for three speakers uh, in the amount of two hours, it it's already shows the interest of how much interest people have. And uh, just to comment a couple of things, because some of, a lot of people are interested about the recording of this session. So just for your information that in a couple of days, we are going to publish uh, the recording of today's session at the University of Central Asia's YouTube channel. Just go to YouTube channel and then say University of Central Asia, and then you will see our, our page there. 
Uh, and then another, a lot of uh, people on social media have asked about the presentations, uh, if they will receive the presentations of our distinguished speakers. So in, in that part, then um, I, will, I will connect with the speakers in, and if they are uh, okay in sharing this with everyone, then we are going to share, uh, share with everyone. So with, with those words, uh, just uh, I would like to also thank the World Bank, the European Union, a strategist, and the government of uh, Tajikistan for uh, the great collaboration that we, we all together uh, uh, have today in, in bringing this, uh, this conference. Uh, our next uh, conference is on also on, on a hot topic about uh, cryptocurrency and Bitcoins. And then we have invited some really, really uh, big names on 4th of May, so st stay tuned. And thank you very much everyone for your time today, for your active participation and all the all the comments and questions thank you and and thank you all the speakers for excellent presentations and then sharing your thoughts your research and with with everyone thank you and have a very nice afternoon